Okay, well, welcome to our video series for Sunday, May 3rd, 2020 here at Tyndale Bible Church. And we, as we have been doing, we have two videos this morning. The first one will be Dispensationalism Part 3. And then the second one will have our continued study in the book of Romans. I believe we're in Romans chapter 9 for this video. But we will also have communion as part of that video at the very end. So if you want to partake of communion, make sure you have your juice and your bread ready to go. As far as announcements, the status of the Sunday services in May are yet to be determined. So we will make the determination, probably my guess, week to week, and determine whether we're going to continue to meet by video or we're going to start uh, meeting in person. Again, a lot of that will be determined by how things go with this COVID-19 virus. So we will see, we will keep everyone updated as to what the status of the Sunday service will be. And again, if you have questions or thoughts on any of these videos, please make sure you reach out to us. Also, make sure you reach out to us on any prayer requests. And then a cartoon, and we talked about Noah last week, so this fits right in. Nobody's leaving this ark until you tell me what you did with those caterpillars. So a little bit of humor. So let's transition now to our study this morning in this first video, and we are... Moving to Dispensationalism Part 3. Now, if you haven't watched Part 1 and 2, make sure you go back and watch those first. Again, watch Part 1 first and then Part 2 because they do build off of each other. So this morning we move into Part 3. I think we're only going to have one more session after this. So we will have four parts, but we will we'll play that one by ear. So before we begin our study this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day you have given to us to study your word. We again thank you for the technology that makes it possible. And we just pray that we'd set this time aside, focus our attention on you, your word, your plan, and that we would just conform our thoughts and our will to your plan. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so Dispensationalism Part 3, and this should be a familiar chart by now. Last time we covered creation to the intertestamental period. So this morning what we want to do is we want to pick up with the intertestamental period and move through the Gospels all the way to the new heaven and new earth. So in other words, we're moving from the beginning of Matthew all the way to Revelation chapter 22. And, and recall from last week, when we spoke of the intertestamental period, that it was a period in human history that had a lot going on in regards to the nation of Israel. Remember, Israel is back in the land, at least the southern kingdom is back from Babylon, back into the land. They are not ruling themselves independently. When we end the book of Malachi, they are under Persian rule. But there's a lot going on, but there's no written revelation happening after the book of Malachi. And I mentioned last time that we, or some, will consider this the silent years, as God has ceased speaking. But when we come into the New Testament, when we come into the Gospels, God starts to speak again. So this silent period ends. And at this point, as we move into the Gospel time, the historical era of the Gospels, Rome has become the dominant power. So we start where... The Gospels start, and that is with the birth of Christ. Now, before Christ is born, though, we have very important revelation where God starts to speak again. And we have the birth announcement of both John and Jesus. And you can look at Luke chapter 1 to see this. And God speaks first to Zacharias. He was a priest at that time in Israel's history. It was his turn to do his temple service. And as he's in the temple, the angel of the Lord spoke to him and said that his wife Elizabeth will be born with a son. And this son would be John. I, I like to refer to him as John, the son of Zacharias. But he is more commonly known as John the Baptist. And then, not too long after this, the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary and reveals to Mary that she will be, again, she's a virgin at this point, she will be with child. And we saw this in Luke chapter 1 a couple weeks ago in our, I believe it was the first part of our dispensational study. And Luke 1, 31 through 33 says, 
And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So we saw this important prophecy that Christ, this Messiah, this child, who's going to be given to Mary here, is going to have the throne of David. He's going to have a kingdom. So right off the bat, as we open the Gospels, the focus of God's plan at this point is kingdom-oriented. So from this, we do move to the actual birth of Christ. We see this in Luke chapter 2. And recall, Joseph and Mary are having to go from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to participate in the census that was ordered at that time. And Luke 2, 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David. And this is going to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, as we saw in part 1. And Mary did, just as the Lord said she would. God is faithful to his word all the time. She did give birth to this son, Luke 2, 7, and she gave birth to her, birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And we're very familiar with the Christmas story, the birth of the Messiah. But it would be wrong for me to skip over the fact that with the birth of Jesus, we have the God-man. That Christ is fully divine, meaning that he doesn't give up any of his deity. This is the second person of the Trinity. This is the eternal Son of God. And he comes, and he is fully divine. He is God. He doesn't lose any of his deity. He doesn't lose 1% of his deity. He, he is 100% fully God when he comes to earth. And at the same time, he's truly human. He's not like a human. He's not similar to a human. He's not 50% human and 50% divine. He's fully divine and truly human at the same time. Now, the one difference between Christ Jesus as a human and us is he is obviously born without a sin nature. So we have the birth of Christ. He is fully divine, truly human. That's why Paul, in Romans chapter 1, we saw this a couple months ago in our study of Romans, he opens up his gospel and he focuses on, in this introduction, both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Look at Romans 1. 3 and 4, concerning his son. And this would be identifying his deity here, recognizing his deity. Who was born, what? Of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Who was declared the son of God. Again, another emphasis on deity. So we have the God-man coming into the world. But from here, from the birth of Christ, we don't have a lot of details as to the early years of Messiah. There's a few things we see but the focus quickly shifts to the ministry of both John and Jesus. So we have the ministry of John again, John the son of Zacharias, John the Baptist, and he comes on the scene, and what does he say? Matthew 3, 1 and 2. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again, a focus on the kingdom. This is a kingdom message that God is ready to bring the kingdom in. And again, what would that kingdom be? Well, that is built off an Old Testament understanding, going back specifically to the Davidic covenant, that God promised David an eternal throne, an eternal house, and an eternal kingdom. And that promise that David would have understood would have been a physical on-earth promise. Not a spiritual, heavenly promise, but an on-earth, physical kingdom. And so we see that when God brings forth this ministry of John the Baptist, he's preaching the kingdom message. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And shortly after John the Baptist is on the scene in his public ministry, he actually baptizes Jesus as we see there in Matthew, and Jesus' earthly ministry begins. And what does he emphasize early in his ministry? From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message that John was preaching. Jesus was preaching the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. Now, the kingdom has not started yet. 
That would be a false assumption to say that with the birth of Jesus, automatically the kingdom is now present. That's not true. But Jesus came to be king. He came to establish this kingdom. But what needs to happen is that Israel needs to accept her Messiah. She needs to accept this kingdom. But they don't. So we see, and in, in, as we go through this New Testament survey this morning, there's a lot of information we could cover. There's a lot in the Gospels, the miracles of Christ, the teachings of Christ that we could get into, but it would make this way too long of a, of a survey. That would be better served for a Life of Christ class or course. So we're going to jump pretty quickly through the Gospels here. So from this offer of the kingdom, we move into the fact that Jesus is rejected. And this rejection is seen particularly in Matthew chapter 12. And the context here, and again, make sure you go back and as you, as you study these verses, as you listen to me go through these verses, go back to, to read the context of these verses. But in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man that who is both blind and mute. And the people begin to recognize, is this the son of David? I.e., is this the coming Messiah? And the Pharisees say, no. They say that Jesus is casting out demons by the power of Satan. So we see this in Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. Okay. So we see that this kingdom offer is rejected. These Pharisees, the leadership of, of Israel, rejects the king and thus his kingdom. So the kingdom offer, that Davidic kingdom that the Lord was ready to bring in, is rejected. So we have a postponement of the kingdom. Now, I, I'm very careful with that word, to choose that word postponement. It's not the cancellation of the kingdom. It's not a transfer of the kingdom. It's a postponement of the kingdom. And that will make more sense as we continue through our New Testament survey. But the scene now shifts to a focus on the cross. So we move from a kingdom offer that is rejected now to a focus on the cross. And be very careful. Make sure you uh, listen real carefully about what I'm about to say because I don't want this to be confused. It's not, I'm not saying that the Lord wanted to offer the kingdom. He's ready to offer it. It was re rejected. Now we're going to move to plan B. There's not a plan A, Jesus is king. Plan B, Jesus going to the cross. There was really essentially two reasons why Jesus came in the flesh. One, to offer the kingdom, and two, to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. So it's not a going from plan A to plan B. It's fulfilling the one plan. There's just two aspects of it. So the one aspect is the offer of the kingdom. The second aspect is Jesus going to the cross. And this was clearly revealed in the Old Testament. There's a great emphasis on the coming Davidic king, the Messiah. And if we had more time in our Old Testament survey, we could focus a lot on the Messianic portions of the Old Testament. But for sake of speed, we, we had to go kind of fast. But we also see in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah, this idea of a suffering servant. And that seems very strange to us that we have this strong Davidic king. Go back to Psalm chapter 2 where he's going to crush the nations with a rod of iron. But at the same time, we have this suffering servant that Isaiah focuses on, you know, Isaiah 53, where he's going to die a brutal death, that he likens himself to a worm. But it's true of our, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's both the God-man. He's both a Davidic king and a suffering servant. So the focus of the Gospels at this point is to hone in on his death, burial, and resurrection. Again, there's a lot we could cover from Matthew 13 all the way up to Matthew, uh, Matthew 27 and the parallel passages in Mark and Luke and then John's account. But again, for sake of speed, we, we go right to the death of Christ. And we see this in, again in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. Each gospel writer gives a very uh, in-depth account of the death of Christ. So, for example, example Matthew 27, verse 15, 51, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So, again, this is after he's tried and finally 
uh, found guilty by Pilate. He goes to the cross. He's nailed to the cross. And he dies for the sin of the world. And recall from last time this offer of Abraham, a land, a seed, and a blessing, and that's expanded upon by the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. And to have this kingdom, you have to have a people that enter into this kingdom, a spiritual people that enter into this kingdom. So the death of Christ is necessary. And this death does not just cover the sins of the Israelites, but it covers the sins of the entire world. Christ dies for all. And salvation only comes to those who believe in Christ, who believe in His person, and who believe in His work on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection. So we are saved by grace through faith. And this is what the cross means. This is what Jesus means. He dies for the sins of the world. We also know that part of that is his burial. We see in Matthew again 27, 59 and 60, and Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in the, his own tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. So we have the death, burial, and then we cannot leave out the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. Matthew 20, 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. So for example... For example, Matthew 28, 6 and 7, He is not here. So this is the angel speaking to the women who come to the tomb. He's not here, for He is risen. Just as He said, come see the place where He was lying. Go quickly and tell His disciples that He's risen from the dead, and behold, He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see Him, and behold, I have told you. So we have the great resurrection of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So when we start thinking about how the New Testament books fit into the picture of this survey, the Gospels cover the period from the birth announcements we see in Luke chapter 1 to the post-resurrection earthly ministry of Christ. Now Christ does not automatically, after He's resurrected, go to the Father. He's on earth for another 40 days. And he continues his earthly ministry, but this time he's, he's, it's post-resurrection. Before his resurrection, it was his pre-resurrection earthly ministry. Now we have the post-resurrection earthly ministry, and the Gospels cover this uh, time period. But we also have to talk about, just for a second, because we, we have those unconditional covenants of the Old Testament, especially the Abrahamic land, Davidic, and New. But what about that Mosaic covenant? We talked about a lot about it last time. And remember, when God gives this covenant in Exodus chapter 19, it covers really the rest of the Old Testament, all the way to Malachi. It plays an important role in how we understand the events of Israel's history. It plays an important role how we understand the prophetic uh, messages that were given by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and Malachi and all the great prophets. Well, with the death of Christ, what we see in regards to the Mosaic Law is that it's ended. It ceases to exist in its operation. And this is an important element. And we didn't talk about this much last time, but with the Noahic, Abrahamic land, Davidic, and New Covenant, those are eternal covenants. But with the Mosaic Covenant, it was a temporary covenant. And this could be seen, for example, in the fact that we have the New Covenant given in Jeremiah 31, in contrast to the Old Covenant. So Paul says in Galatians 3, 24 and 25, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And the book of Galatians really works this idea out. The Galatians... Uh, were believers. The book of Galatians was not written to unbelievers or to, or to false believers, but to believers. And these believers had been given bad information by false teachers that they were to continue, they were to continue their spiritual life living under law. And Paul says, no, you are saved by grace through faith, not by law. But he also takes it a step further. You're not sanctified. You don't live your spiritual life under law. Just as you were saved... From the penalty of sin by grace through faith, you are to walk by grace through faith. So as we move into the church age, which we'll talk about that in just a minute, we are not under Mosaic law. 
That is not our standard of living. That is not our spiritual guide as to how we are to live our lives. So that's an important aspect. Mosaic law has ended. And look at the book of Hebrews. And one of the great contrasts that the writer brings up is Mosaic law versus new covenant. And he makes a very dramatic point to the Hebrew believers at that point in church history who wanted to go back to Judaism and go back to the law. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, there's such a greater life outside of the law. So from the resurrection of Christ and his post-resurrection earthly ministry, we move now to the ascension of Christ. And this happens 40 days after the resurrection. And we see this as the book of Acts opens up. And he's still teaching his disciples. And in Acts 1.9 he says, And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he's standing around teaching his disciples, and all of a sudden he's gone. And this is what we refer to as the ascension of Christ. And he goes to not the Davidic throne. He goes to the right hand of the Father. Still ministering as our intercessor. But he's not taking the Davidic throne at this time. Because again, think back to how David would have understood those promises given to him. He would have understood it in a literal way. That's why we talk about the literal grammatical historical hermeneutical method. That's how we understand the Bible. David would have understood a earthly throne, an earthly kingdom. So to say that when Christ ascends, he ascends to a spiritual Davidic throne is not how David would have understood it. That changes the promises given to David. And even to say that he's on David's throne spiritually right now, but later there's going to be a physical throne, that drastically changes the Old Testament promises. We've got to let the Old Testament establish the foundation as we understand the movement through the New Testament. We cannot reverse that course as I think I ended last time saying. We cannot change from, we cannot allow the New Testament to dictate how we understand the Old Testament. Okay? We've got to build on a good Old Testament foundation. So Christ ascends to the Father. And then 10 days after that, so 50 days after the resurrection, we have the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see this in Acts chapter 2. So read this in your time just to focus on a couple things here. The day of Pentecost had come. So again, this would be the 50 days. And there's this group of believers, the disciples are there. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And what was that? Well, that was the coming of the Holy Spirit, the advent of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, again, we talk about the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's always existed, and He's everywhere at all times. But this is a specific function, ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit as He comes to indwell these believers here in Acts chapter 2. And just as a side note, they began speaking in tongues. And if you read that in context, they're speaking in known languages. And this was a common phenomenon at this point in biblical and in church history. As, again, the New Testament had not been written. We are into a drastic transition at this point. Remember, Mosaic law lasted from Exodus 19.20, from the exodus of the Israelites, and they go to the Mount Sinai all the way through the book of Malachi, all the way through the Old Testament uh, or intertestamental period, all the way through the Gospels until the death of Christ. Mosaic law was the standard, and now all of a sudden, Christ has fulfilled the law. And we have this transition. So we see the spiritual phenomenon of the uh, gift of tongues here, or the speaking in tongues here, as a way to verify this message. But with the closing of the New Testament canon, when God has revealed all He is going to reveal in written form, then this gift ceases and and leaves the scene. And we're left with the sufficient Word of God at that point. So just as a side note. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 2, what we see now is the start of the church age. And the church is... Believers, uh, Jew and Gentile, unified in the body of Christ. All those who believe in Jesus Christ. Up to this point, we haven't talked about the church. Through our Old Testament survey and through our our work through the Gospels, we have not talked about the church. And the reason is, is because the Old Testament 
doesn't speak of the church. It's not even prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, there are prophecies that God will bless the Gentiles, that His program is not just for Israel only, but for the Gentiles as well, i.e. the whole world. It's just Israel is the focus. He, God is using Israel to carry out these plans and purposes. But we can't equate that the blessing of the Gentiles to the church either because the church is unprophesied. Paul likens it to a mystery in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, something that is unrevealed. The first time we actually see this church spoken of is in Matthew 16, 18, where Christ says in future tense, I will build my church. So with Acts chapter 2, we see that prophecy being fulfilled. Christ begins to bring His church into existence. So the book of Acts provides us with a, with a descriptive account of the early history of the church as the gospel moves from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the remotest part of the world, which at that time, Paul, uh, the book of Acts is probably referencing Rome because as we end Acts, Paul is on a boat heading to Rome and ultimately to preach the gospel. And I, I make that point, it's a descriptive account because it's not prescriptive. Okay? What is prescriptive, we move into the New Testament epistles. And these epistles, the Pauline epistles, the non-Pauline epistles like First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, the Book of Jude, Book of James, Book of Hebrews, all those, including the Pauline epistles, are all written to the churches, and they were instructive in nature. They were for a specific historical account. They weren't just random thoughts. There was usually some type of situation going on that the New Testament author wanted to address. So what we see in the New Testament epistles is an emphasis on instruction both in doctrine and in duty. And the New Testament epistles are very important for our church life today, our spiritual life today. It's what gives us the standard for living. Now, in saying that, I'm not saying that the Old Testament and the Gospels are not important. They are. They are crucial to understand New Testament epistles. So we have the whole counsel of God, as I opened up with in our first part, that is essential to understand. But as far as the standard of living, the New Testament epistles take a, a very strong priority. So in saying that, and bringing up this idea of the church, this is an important question. What about those covenant promises to Israel? What happened to those? Now we have this drastic shift from Israel to the church. Well, we got, off, we got to start off by saying the church is not the new Israel. In other words, the church does not replace Israel. Nowhere in the New Testament does the writer ever equate Israel and the church together as one group. So the church does not become a new Israel. The church does not replace Israel. And it's essential to understand that part because we have these unconditional covenants. God does not transfer the promises of a covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and their descendants to a different group of people. That just is not the biblical approach. So these unconditional covenants are made with Abraham and his descendants, and they continue to be made with Abraham and his descendants. And a great, I think, uh, chapter or section to look at and understand how Israel and the church relate together, at least in God's plan, is Romans 9-11, through 11, which we're going to be starting in our, in our study in Romans here. That God has a plan and purpose for Israel. Romans chapter 9 talks about God's plan in the past. Romans chapter 10 talks about God's plan with Israel here and now, in the present. And then chapter 11 focuses on the future of Israel. And as we see, Israel has a future separate from the church. There is this complete distinction between the church and Israel. So it's very important to understand at this point, the covenants are not transferred to the church. Now, we may receive blessings from those covenants, but we do not fulfill them. Remember part A, part B. That in a covenant we have two parties. Party A, party B. That God is party A, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his descendants, David, are part B. The church does not come and be part B. 
It does not replace Part B. It does not even, it does not even uh, come alongside Part B. The covenants God will fulfill with those He made them with. So again, we may get blessings from them, but we do not fulfill them. So again, what, go back to that question. What about those covenant promises? Well, God will fulfill those covenant promises with Israel. But that fulfillment at this point in history is postponed, temporarily postponed. After the church age, which we'll talk about in just a minute, God will fulfill His covenants with Israel. He is faithful to His word. He will fulfill them exactly as He said He would. So we see at this point that Israel is a major part of God's plan. They are a major part of God's plan. As they come out of the Exodus, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way in the Gospels, and then as we will see as we come into the book of Revelation. And remember that. For example, Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8 says, and you can read this in detail, but your God has chosen you to be a people for His own possession out of the peoples. As He's speaking of Israel there. In verse 8, but because the Lord has loved you, God loves the nation of Israel. He calls in the apple of His eye in the Old Testament. And they are a major part of His plan. He just doesn't throw them to the side because they're disobedient. They were a disobedient people. But those unconditional nature of the covenants means that whether they are obedient or disobedient doesn't make it where God is going to fulfill or not going to fulfill. They're unconditional. God will fulfill His purposes no matter what Israel does. He loves His people. He chose His people. And at the same time, as the church comes into existence in Acts 2, the church becomes a very important part of God's plan. And likewise, He loves the church. And Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. And then he uses a simile here. As Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. So we have two peoples of God at this time. Israel and the church. And God loves both. And God uses both these people groups for His plan, His purposes, and ultimately for His glory. So when will the church end? Well, it's going to happen at what we call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And you can go back and look at this. I want to focus on verse 17, though. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord. And this is the event we call the rapture. Why do we call it the rapture? Well, that word for caught up in, in Greek is harpazo. Now, that sounds nothing like rapture. But when you look at the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the New Testament, we have the word rapero, rapio. That is where we get our word rapture from. So it's a biblical idea. We just don't derive the actual word rapture from the Greek. We, we get it from the Vulgate. So I'm not saying we get the doctrine from the Vulgate. We get the doctrine, obviously, in Paul's letter there in the Greek. So the Lord is going to catch up His church to bring us with Him. So when will this happen? When will this occur? When will the rapture occur? We have no idea. Scripture does not give us a timeline as to when the rapture will occur. It is referred to as an imminent happening, meaning it can occur at any point in time, any point in history. As we're recording this video or as we're watching the video, it may happen, which on a side note is very practical doctrine. It's not just an end times doctrine for the sake of study. But practically, we need to be ready to meet our Lord in the air for the rapture. But after the rapture, the next prophetic event is referred to as the tribulation. Now, the rapture does not start the tribulation. There is no tie between when the rapture occurs and when the tribulation occurs, except for the rapture will happen before the tribulation. We just don't know at what point after the rapture the tribulation occurs. And the word tribulation, probably not the best word to use. Probably better to reference Daniel's 70th week. And Daniel's 70th week goes back to Daniel chapter 9, 
specifically verses 20 and 27. And this is an important section of Old Testament Scripture that lays the foundation for the eschatology or the doctrine of last things as we move through the New Testament. So you can read that on your own time. I have highlighted a couple things here in Daniel chapter 9, specifically in verse 24. It starts off by saying 70 weeks have been decreed. And the way to better understand that is 77s, or 70 groups of seven years, which if you do the math, that's 490 years. So there's this prophetic timeline given, a very specific uh, timeline. So we see in verse 25, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the decree would have been given in 445 B.C. We see this in the book of Nehemiah. Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, i.e. 69 weeks. So we have 70 weeks total from the issue of the decree to the death of Messiah is going to be 69 weeks, which we see in verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, which also you have to include the seven weeks, so the 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. So we, when Christ dies, we have 69 of the weeks completed. We still have one week left, which would be 1-7 or a seven-year time period. So verse 27, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. And it's here in verse 27 that we see the start of the tribulation. So the start of this seven-year time period, this tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, technically begins, not with the rapture, but the signing of the peace treaty. So again, highlight Daniel 9.27. And he, and this is Antichrist, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So this begins the tribulation, and it begins in a time of peace as Antichrist begins this covenant, this peace treaty. But in the middle of that week, so half of seven years is three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And this becomes what is known as the Great Tribulation. We see in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, and then in verse 21, for there will be a great tribulation. So the first half of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, seem to be somewhat peaceful. And then we have the breaking of this covenant, we have the abomination of desolation, and we see the beginning of a great tribulation. And the last three and a half years is going to be tremendous wrath and judgment. And we see this in chapters 6 through 18 in the book of Revelation. We think about the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments. All this is occurring during Daniel's 70th week. And at the end of this seven-year time period, what we see is the return of Christ. Remember, He ascended to the right hand of the Father. At the end of the tribulation, Christ comes back. And we see this specifically in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. So you can read that on your, old, on your own time. The church comes back with Him. We get to rule and reign with Christ because He, at that point, will establish His kingdom. That Davidic kingdom that was promised to David, the literal, physical, earthly kingdom is going to come to earth. And Christ is going to rule from David's throne on earth. And we're given an additional note that this kingdom is a thousand years, as spoken of in Revelation 20, verse 6. Now, this is a new piece of the puzzle. It doesn't change anything given to David. It still aligns with that physical, earthly promise. But it's a thousand years, and in a sense, I liken it to a prelude to all eternity. It's not that the kingdom is going to be a thousand years and then God's going to annihilate everything. The kingdom is going to be ushered into the new heaven and new earth for all eternity. So when we see the kingdom established, we see that the unconditional covenants, the Abrahamic, the land, the Davidic, and the new covenant are fulfilled with God's people Israel. God is faithful to His word with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants. And the great thing is that the church gets to participate in the kingdom. We rule and reign with Christ. We don't fulfill the covenants in any way, but we are blessed through God's covenant plan. 
And then we come to Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10, we see the judgment of Satan. Because after this thousand years, or during a thousand years, Satan is confined, but at the end, he is released and he leads a rebellion against the Lord, where the Lord quickly puts it down and judges Satan. So in Revelation 20, 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan is finally dealt with. Satan who comes on the scene, Genesis chapter 3 is a serpent, is judged and dealt with never to influence God's righteous people again. And then as we move to 11 through 15 in Revelation 20, we have the judgment of the unbelievers, the great white throne judgment. And this is a sobering judgment as we look at verses 11 and 12. And on a practical note, this is more than just study knowledge for study's sake. This should have a practical impact on how we live our life as, as we witness to the unbelieving world. All those who believe in Christ and in His work don't have to participate in a great white throne judgment. We are saved by grace through faith. The unbelieving world, they will face this judgment. So this should be a sobering reminder that we are to be witnesses. We are to be preaching the word. We are to be focusing our talents, our resources in evangelism. So Revelation 20, 11 through 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. So God judges the unrighteous. Now, as believers, we will not be again in the great white throne judgment because God has saved us by grace through faith we do not go through this part which is exciting at the same time it should again remind us to be evangelists ambassadors for Christ and at this point this kingdom is ushered into the new heaven and new earth we see this in Revelation 21 and 22 and just a few verses as we close out there's a lot going on in the world. People are, are losing their finances. They're losing their health. They're losing loved ones. They talk about food shortages and all this other. So there's so much negativity and problematic things going on in this world. But look what we see. Look what the hope that we have as believers. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first, first earth passed away. And there's no longer any sea. So God is ushering this kingdom in. He's creating this new heaven and new earth. Verses 3 and 4, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. That harkens back to the pre-fall time in the garden. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. We never have to worry about death again. Never. Not to worry about pandemics and cancer and car accidents. There will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. Verse 6, Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Then we come into chapter 22, verse 3. There will no longer be any curse. Think back to Genesis 3. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. We will serve the Lord in righteousness. We will be in His presence. So verse 16, as we close out chapter 22, Revelation and the counsel of God, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you, to you these things for the churches. Again, this highlights the fact that the book of Revelation is written to the churches. I am the root and what? The descendant of David, hearkening back to the, the promise of this Davidic king and kingdom. The bright morning star. And the book ends with a wonderful note. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. What a way to wrap up the counsel of God. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And this takes us from the opening of the Gospels through the book of Revelation it takes us from the birth of Christ to the new heaven and new earth. 
So with that in mind and with the Old Testament survey in mind, again, understanding it from a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic, consistently applied from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, now we have an understanding of God's plan, especially God's covenantal, biblical covenants for human history, starting with the Noahic, moving to the Abrahamic, which is expanded by the land, the Davidic and the New Covenant, and a temporary covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, that was made with the nation of Israel as both a constitutional covenant, but also as a way to lead them to the Lord. So with that in mind, next week, Lord willing, we're going to come back and we're going to start talking about theology known as dispensational theology. And theology simply just means a way to explain what we understand the Bible to say. So we'll end hopefully with that with that video, with that section, and hopefully by that time you'll have a good understanding not only what dispensationalism is, but what God's plan is, how He's working it out, and how He is faithful to His covenants and He is faithful to His promises. Father, we do thank You for this time. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this time to study it, and we just pray You'll be glorified through it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So see you in part four.